Welcome everybody to our webinar, Housing as a Human Right, Integrating the EU Charter of Human Rights into EU Economic Governance and Financial Supervision. And I'm very happy to host um, this webinar together with my fellow Green MEP Ernest Ortizun and Maria Aldanas from Fianza. And I would also like to welcome Professor Patrick Kenner, who will give us a short keynote later on, and to welcome the members of our panel, uh, Michaela Kauer from the city of Vienna, who was the coordinator of the housing partnership of the urban agenda of the EU. And I'm very sure she will be able to present us with some concrete recommendations regarding housing as a human right. And also, I'm very much looking forward to the reaction from Mr. Luc Tolonia from the European Commission. So welcome, everybody. Um, I will also shortly introduce myself. My name is Kim van Sparatak. I'm an MEP for uh, the Green Group in the European Parliament since last July. And I am currently the rapporteur on the own initiative report on decent and affordable housing for all. And um, this is one of the first reports uh, from the uh, Employment and Social Affairs Com Committee in the European Parliament. And I think it is very clear that uh, what the reason is why we have this as one of the first reports that will come out of this uh, parliamentary term. Um, we see that there's a huge housing crisis all over Europe. Um, there are soaring housing prices, uh, approximately 700,000 rough sleepers in the European Union. And 10% of households spend more than 40% of their income on housing. And um, it's, an, it's both uh, a crisis in terms of that there is not enough housing, but also that there's a huge affordability crisis. We see that housing has become an object for profit rather than a right to have a roof over your head. And this is something that has to change all over Europe. And we also see now during the COVID-19 crisis that there's a huge correlation between um, uh, unaffordable, of uh, inadequate housing and um, the COVID mortality rate. Um, we see that there's a higher mortality rate amongst people who are living in overcrowded housing. We see that uh, people who are homeless are at a much higher risk. And one thing that is that we see and hear very often is that the European Union doesn't have a competence. We don't have a competence, apparently, to talk about housing. But there are so many policies on a European level that actually have a major impact on the access to affordable housing. We have the state aid rules that define to who member states can give social housing. The European Union can decide where we can invest. Can we invest in more social housing? Um, but also now when we're talking about greening the European Union, um, how much can we invest in the renovation wave? And how can we make sure that this doesn't become a renovation wave where uh, housing only gets more expensive, but rather that we make sure that um, people uh, can actually afford their houses better, that their energy bills go down and they have a more secure place to live in and also a healthier life. And that's why I'm also very happy that uh, Fianza is willing to organize this webinar with us. Um, they have a huge long-standing record on fighting for adequate housing for the most vulnerable groups. And I would like now to give the floor to Maria Aldanas to give a short introduction of the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Policy Officer of Fianza and Coordinator of the Housing Rights Watch Network, an initiative that we Maria, we Maria? cannot hear you. Oh, okay, good. So that means that I'm muted. I just heard you, so it should work. Okay. Okay, now it works. Can you hear me now? No. Hmm. Mm. Great. Maybe you can use this. Can you hear me now? No. Oh, so it's only me that can't hear you, I see. So you can just continue. <laughs> mm. 
Maria, I think you're muted. You should unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Now it's perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Should I start then? I'm policy officer at Fianza and coordinator of, on, of Housing Rights Watch Network, an initiative that we manage in partnership with the Friends Foundation of Appear. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Greens for this unique opportunity and more precisely to Ernest and Kim uh, and their teams for hosting this event with us. And I would like to thank Bobby. He has worked with us for over a decade now, and he, he was a founding member of the Housing Rights Expert Group before Housing Rights Watch even existed. So, um, in Housing, housing Rights Watch, we are committed to promoting the right to adequate housing for all. And this webinar today is a fine reminder that the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights is binding on EU institutions. And I'm looking forward to an interesting debate also with Luke Poloniad and Mike, Michaela Kauer. So this is all from my side. Thank you so much. And looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and uh, now I um, would like to, um, to reintroduce um, Patrick Kenna. Um, he doesn't only recognize housing as a human right on paper, but he also is very good at developing strong argumentation why the EU needs to change its policies in order to fulfill them. So I would really like to give the floor now to uh, Patrick. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Good evening. Buenas noches. Buenas serata. Bonsoir. Good evening to you all. I am delighted to be able to present to you here this evening on housing as a human right. This presentation focuses on the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights more particularly. It seeks to open up a discussion on how EU institutions can observe, respect and promote charter housing rights as required by the Charter itself. But first, let me thank Ernest Ertison MEP and his team, along with Kim Van Sparentech, MEP, and Maria Aldenas, a fiancé, without whom this event would not have happened. So thanks very much for this opportunity. This presentation is based on three research papers published recently, Housing and Housing Rights in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, EU Governance and Financial Supervision, and how we integrate charter housing rights into this framework. Not easy, some would say. The briefings seek to demonstrate that without in any way changing the competences and mandates of the EU institutions, there is considerable scope for charter housing rights to be applied and promoted. The link to these briefing papers will be available after this event. Housing is, of course, one of the defining issues of our time as you have pointed out, Kim. It is central to the Green New Deal. It's also central to the social and economic sustainability of the EU. As Manuel Albert has stated, any monetary gains in the labor market are quickly snapped up in the housing market. But surely we can afford to see a generation of Europeans excluded from adequate housing because it costs too much. So turning now to the first slide, Jaron, um, this is an overview of housing issues in Europe. Uh, are you all able to see this slide? It's the first one previous to this, previous, previous to this. Yes, this is it. So these, we're going to slide, there we go. Uh, many of you will be aware about, of these figures. Um, some 80 million Europeans are now overburdened by housing costs, including a quarter of private tenants. Some 700,000 people are homeless. European Commission and other reports show that lack of affordable housing in many European cities affects all sectors of society now but particularly impacts on poor and socially excluded people, migrant workers and minorities. Uh, next slide is, um, okay, can we go to slide next there? Yes, okay. 
At the same time, however, house prices in the euro area have risen by 20% since 2016, setting the trend for rents and affordability. Even middle class households are now unable to buy a home in Europe's cities. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we see any large European city has the same problems. The financialization of housing, privatization, individualization, social housing has created a affordable housing crisis right across Europe, as Kim has pointed out. Today, many even question whether it's possible to provide a large level of social housing anymore, given the high land and development costs in Europe cities. When 1 billion, 1 billion euro will only provide 3,000 homes, we need to address the question of why housing is so costly in Europe. Renovation costs, of course, are, are less, but we also have to ask, why are European banks and regulators fueling this situation? Now, I'm getting some feedback. Um, I'm not sure if it's from my computer or from some other one. But let's go to the next one on bank assets. Jerome. So, as part of my research, I came across some very interesting reports by the European Systemic Risk Board. And one of these shows that housing and real estate loans amounted to 70% of mean bank lending in some member states, and over 50% in 12 Eurozone countries. Um, the conclusion I have come to here is that housing is becoming oh, the wobbly pillar of EU banking stability. And this land credit cycle, which has been written about by Ryan Collins and others, poses a risk to social and economic sustainability. Political and public responses to this are required now at European wide level. And so turning now to the challenge of housing rights, which is our next slide, we can see that for more than a century, European states have recognized housing rights in their constitutions, in their laws, in their policies, in their state systems. All European countries have adopted UN and Council of Europe human and housing rights. These oblige European states to ensure access to housing for all and to regularly report to the international monitoring bodies on how this is being achieved. More recently, the European pillar of social rights has been integrated into the European semester. It was also endorsed by many of the incoming commissioners as part of their mandates at the end of last year. But this is a very important perspective. We need a European perspective. The actors in housing rights today are transnational regulators, European institutions, and in some cases, global corporations, rather than traditional duty-bearing nation states. And so that's why the Charter of Fundamental Rights is so important, because the Charter contains in it a whole range of housing rights, which we will see now in the next slide. And so I have here gathered some of the uh, housing rights which have been codified in the Charter. Most of them are taken from international human rights instruments and European member states provisions. Uh, you, you will be familiar with many of them, especially Article 34.3, which is regularly cited. Uh, the union recognizes the right to social and housing assistance so as to ensure a decent existence for all those who lack sufficient resources. But of course, you all know that that is limited somewhat by the its context, which is Article 153 um, of the treaty, the social inclusions policies. What many people don't refer to, uh, which I'd like to draw your attention to, are Articles 33 and 36 
33 on the rights of families to enjoy legal, economic and social protection has been interpreted to include access to adequate and affordable housing. Article 36 states that the union re recognizes and respects access to services of general economic interest. And this includes social housing. While the finer definitions of this are being debated, there's no dispute on whether this article of the Charter is established in European law. The rights of older people, children and people with disabilities are also significant here. The, the Charter, as I've mentioned, codifies all these rights, brings them into binding EU law in certain circumstances. And I want to look at those briefly in the next slide. So Article 51 of the Charter points out that, some of you will be aware of that, the Charter is addressed to member states when they implement EU law, only when they implement EU law. But of course, all EU institutions, agencies, bodies and offices must respect the rights, observe the principles and promote the application of the Charter. This is a key aspect of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. As the Charter does not grant standalone rights, it's this interpretive function which is so significant. And of course, this applies in the application of EU policies and regulations. And Article 33 and 36 are very significant here in the context of EU economic governance. Some institutions, such as the European Commission, have set out strategies for applying the Charter. Others have not yet addressed these obligations. And that brings us to the question of competences. And if we go to the next slide, we'll briefly look at the question of housing competences. Some of you will, of course, immediately raise your hand and say housing is a member state competence. There is no EU competence here. Uh, I hear that. I hear that all the time. My response is that member states through the union through the European Union, have developed a range of legal and regulatory measures which impact on and are actually constitutive of national housing systems. You will see some of them listed here, the rules on the internal market, public procurement, environmental protection, consumer protection, energy efficiency, etc., construction products. Quite a lot of these are constitutive of national housing systems. But of course, housing finance has become a key European issue. EU economic governance impacts on the level and the nature of mortgage lending at member state level, non-performing loans, interest rates even, as well as the limits and costs of government borrowing for housing investment. As we know, housing serves a dual purpose, acting both as an investment asset and a consumer good, our home, the investment status has taken on a powerful EU dimension. Significant European supervisory and regulatory measures in this area actually now constitute the primary EU housing policy approach. That is to protect banking assets under the rubric of financial stability. Indeed, since the crash of 2009, an elaborate system of economic governance and financial supervision has been established. The main banks are supervised from Frankfurt and enormous EU resources are directed at measuring national average house prices for signs of credit fueled house price bubbles. These are seen as indicators of potential bank crashes, which could lead to a new national, regional or international crisis. This policy rubric runs through all EU policy, even the European semester. Its model of housing systems is based on viewing homes as residential real estate or collateral and subject to constant cycles of bubble and burst, as we can see from the next slide, which is a recent ES or B chart, which sets out the characteristics of real estate market cycles or housing market cycles. And these are very instructive because 
they seem to suggest that we are tied into an inevitable round of booms and busts as part of a housing cycle with downturns, recessions, recoveries, and then expansions in prices. Uh, there isn't any consideration of the social intervention measures which states and the European Union can take to prevent the excesses of these cycles, the role and extent of social and affordable housing in member states, and its interaction with housing markets is not considered. Thus, a narrow view of EU housing competences would ignore these dynamics and interconnectedness of market and non-market elements in European housing systems. In fact, the next slide also shows something of a more systemic problem. Uh, the way the ESRB classifies social housing as part of commercial real estate illustrates the difficulty in developing coherent EU institutional approaches to social and affordable housing. This narrow approach is not easily addressed, especially when the ECB monetary policy based on price stability or controlling inflation does not include house prices in its calculations. And then we go to the next slide. The European semester, however, takes a much more holistic approach, referring to the European pillar of social rights but also many other aspects of housing systems. This explicitly recognized the obligations of Principle 19, which I know some of you had uh, involvement in, in developing. This states that access to social housing or housing assistance of good quality shall be provided for those in need, shall be provided. The Commission, of course, provides member states with policy support, guidance, and orientation on efficient policies for ensuring access to affordable and social housing. In the semester process, it highlights housing supply shortages, dysfunctional housing markets, macroeconomic imbalances, and most importantly, insufficient stocks of social and affordable housing. The next slide, though, highlights what I call gaps. And the central point of this presentation, however, is to show how EU charter housing rights and social and affordable housing are largely excluded from the economic governance architecture of the EU. The social and political consequences of this are significant. And yet we have the means to address this deficit through the application of EU charter rights. And in my next slide, I want to point out that the briefing papers, which will be available after this presentation, outline some 28 recommendations uh, addressed to EU institutions and MEPs. Among these are recommendations to all EU institutions, agencies, bodies, and offices to respect the rights, observe the principles, and promote the application of the Charter. And that's a very important point because the Charter has this section on promoting the application, which hasn't really been addressed largely in the human rights literature. We need to see how charter housing rights are considered, especially articles 33 and 36, in the economic governance reports of all the EU institutions. All EU institutions must recognize that social housing is an integral part of services of general economic interest. This not only keeps property bubbles in check, but meets EU policy objectives of economic stability, combating climate change, social inclusion, and application of charter rights. The European Parliament oversight of EU economic governance institutions needs to be strengthened. The reports from economic governance agencies must set out explicitly how charter housing rights have been respected and promoted. In all of this, there is a major role for housing rights advocates, advocates and NGOs to assist the EU institutions in developing these standards. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights is now 10 years old. While it doesn't create standalone housing rights, it does create binding obligations on EU institutions 
acting within their competences and mandates to respect and promote housing rights. Charter obligations can provide legitimacy for more people-centered institutional measures. These underpin and interact with national housing systems all the time. We need to promote balanced housing systems, offering choice, flexibility, security, sustainability, affordability, and adequacy of housing. At the same time, a sufficient supply of affordable housing can smooth out the cyclical nature of the property market and lessen the impact of property and house price bubbles, which destabilize economies. It also protects the rights of those at risk of losing their homes and the rights of homeless people. Today, civil society organizations, housing rights advocates, public representatives, especially MEPs, and policymakers can engage with EU institutions to ensure that charter rights are respected and promoted. These three briefings, which on the next slide you will find the link, offer some information on how this might be achieved for the benefit of EU citizens. We must remember it is the very possibility of elaborating rights, of developing rights, and not just supervising their execution, that sets the EU apart from other international bodies promoting human rights. So I hope you download the briefings and thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Um, yeah, I think now it's time to, to hear some of the responses from our panel. Um, and also, I would like to welcome the people uh, watching from home to, if you have any questions to any of our panelists or to the professor, um, please leave them in the chat. Um, so first, I would like to uh, ask a question um, to uh, Mr. Teloriat from the commission. Um, because um, when we hear this case for, for housing and the need to, to strengthen the right to housing in the European Union, um, I'm wondering uh, what would it mean um, in terms of the recovery plan? Um, because homelessness and affordable housing are, are all absent so far. So is the European Commission considering in the framework of the different regulations that will complement the recovery plan to give relevance to housing policies? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks for having me uh, and good evening, everyone. And, and thanks for your question. Uh, maybe I'll just make a couple of remarks and then go straight to your question and then leave time for, for exchange and debate with, with the other panelists and, and indeed uh, other participants. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that uh, Patrick was very right to say that a lot of things have happened over the last 20 years uh, uh, that now shape how housing policy through EU instruments. Uh, I started myself, my career in the Commission 20 years ago at the time of the so-called Lisbon strategy. And uh, back then we were only dealing uh, with housing issues in the context of a so-called open method of coordination on social exclusion. And it's really thanks to uh, actors like FIENSA and indeed the European Parliament that these issues are now uh, taking center stage at European level. There's been uh, defining moments in these 20 years, uh, the Charter, is definitely a, a cornerstone and a milestone. Uh, Patrick mentioned also the, the great financial crisis and how new uh, instruments were developed at European level to prevent macro imbalances and draw the lessons from the crisis where indeed uh, the state of real estate markets uh, led to bubbles that were unsustainable and threatened financial sustainability across Europe. And then more recently, uh, Patrick also mentioned the European pillar of social rights uh, closer to us which provides a, a renewed framework very much inspired from the Charter and, and updated in a way. Uh, so now the, the situation is such that indeed, uh, while uh, the primary competencies for housing uh, issues are definitely with the member states and oftentimes very much at the local level, there is a whole range of tools at European level in the field of economic governance that directly or indirectly play a role. Uh, Patrick mentioned the European Semester of Economic Policy Coordination and I think uh, this is a, a very important tool uh, to provide an integrated view, uh, combining economic, social and environmental perspective on a country. 
but also to account for the very wide diversity of uh, housing markets, of situations, and indeed of competencies at, at national level. So uh, this is a very important tool and a new tool. By the way, it's not just the country-specific recommendations uh, that are adopted every year. We adopted a, a new package two weeks ago. Uh, it's also the annual reports, which we publish every year uh, in the month of February, that, that gives a view and inform you uh, on each, each country. Uh, Patrick mentioned financial supervision. I don't go back there. I just want to highlight, since you're asking about financing, I just want to highlight two new tools of economic governance that are not always well known or well perceived because they're recently new. The first one is what we call technical assistance uh, to member states, support for reforms. Uh, this is a new tool we started to develop in 2015 with a new service called DG Reform, which is basically here to help member states uh, design uh, policies. So we finance upstream the design of policies. And, and uh, there's more than 1,000 projects that have started over the last years. And I can just quote an example of France uh, now uh, introducing a request for technical support to implement its five-year housing strategy based on the so-called housing first principles, which is uh, very dear to, to the heart of, of many actors here. So these are new new tools, uh, let's say supportive tools that, that have emerged and that uh, we need to make good use of. Another tool is of course funding, and that links to your question. Uh, most of you are very familiar with the, the action of the European Structural Investment Funds, uh, so-called European Regional Development Fund, the European Social Fund, to support public investments. And these are very powerful tools, uh, but there is also a new uh, development at European level, which is to uh, leverage private investment and, and mobilize uh, cheap loans in support of infrastructure projects. And this was uh, very much developed over the last years in the context of the so-called Juncker plan together with the European Investment Bank. And I'm thinking of the European uh, in, uh, Fund for Strategic Investments in particular, so-called FC. Uh, we estimate now that more than 500,000 uh, social and affordable housing units have been built or renovated through this fund across Europe with projects uh, in France, Poland, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Germany, and others. And these are very large infrastructure projects benefiting from uh, uh, financing through the EIB. Uh, but these are also very, I would say, more innovative and groundbreaking uh, so-called impact-oriented project for marginalized groups. Uh, I'm here quoting just an example, so-called back-on-track project in Belgium to help young people avoid homelessness. These are new tools that are, I would say, less known to a number of actors, which I think can, can inspire for the future. Now coming to your question about, about the future uh, and in this uh, recovery plan, what could be the possibilities? Um, what you saw there is, is uh, indeed a, a tremendous uh, effort to put additional money into a number of uh, existing and new programs. There's a lot of um, money that would be driven to a new instrument called the Recovery and Residence Facility, which would support so-called national recovery plans that would be presented by member states covering both reforms and investments. And I could well imagine, and it is indeed the, the ambition of the Commission, that this recovery plan should fit the broader priorities of the green and digital transition, including in the field of energy efficiency, uh, housing refurbishments, uh, urban agendas. These are typically the type of reforms uh, that require a, a very broad investment. In addition to this so-called facility, we are reinforcing a number of uh, programs, the so-called uh, structural funds. I mentioned it through an initiative called React EU. We're also trying to boost uh, the successor to the Juncker plan. It is now called InvestEU, which has a specific window for social infrastructure. Uh, based on the principles that I mentioned. So there's a lot of new possibilities. I mean, the plan is just proposed. We have to make sure that it is agreed before uh, we, we can act on it. But it is a very ambitious uh, new agenda. Let me just conclude with a few remarks about what's coming up. And I'm, I'm, I appreciate that uh, there is a report being prepared by the European Parliament on these important issues. I just want to flag uh, for everyone four work streams that will keep us busy this year and I think on which we could uh, exchange more in the coming months. Uh, the first work stream is the fact that the, co the Commission has initiated a public consultation on a new strategy for the implementation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. It is now confirmed in the work program, it's happening now, uh, we aim to conclude by the end of the year. The second work stream 
is the review of the economic governance framework, uh, what Patrick started to mention. We initiated a very broad consultation in February this year. Uh, obviously, we were taken aback uh, and we had to reschedule and postpone a bit the activities due to the ongoing crisis. Uh, but this is definitely an area where we are working on and, and consulting heavily. A third work stream is the work which is being done, and I know uh, Fiensa and colleagues are also very much in touch with DG Employment, other colleagues in the Commission, on uh, preparing an action plan for the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights. Uh, this is foreseen for 2021, and there is a public consultation uh, uh, at the end, uh, finishing the end of November. And obviously, uh, to come back to your point, the recovery plan is now, of course, uh, uh, key to everything we do, so we can discuss more in our exchange what aspects of the recovery plan could help uh, boost uh, these activities in the future. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, it's very uh, good to hear that um, housing is becoming a is becoming a larger part and, and more important in your uh, in your policies. And I really hope that we're going to see that uh, concretely as well in the coming future. Um, Miss. Gower, I would really like to ask you now to comment on what you just heard and also maybe to, to broaden the scope a bit. So by, besides financing and, and the more, you know, um, financial instruments that we have, what, what would you say that, uh, that we can do on a European level to uh, promote affordable housing? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. So uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the invite. I'm really pleased that this takes place. I think it's a perfect moment in time to do that, as we are now uh, already seeing the housing challenges emerging from the corona crisis, sadly enough. But this also makes a little bit clearer, or gives a clearer picture of who is in the position to contribute to the solution. Uh, and as uh, I was introduced friendly by uh, Kim, I've been the coordinator of the Urban Agenda Housing Partnership. And in the name urban, you can already see that there is an issue with cities, which have not been mentioned at the moment uh, until now in this, in this webinar. And I think that when you're looking for the partners that the European Union should address in finding solutions to the housing crisis, we have seen uh, on the rise since the beginning of the of 2008-2009 with the global financial crisis, it is the cities. And it is the mayors and the people working for the cities administrations that have been in close cooperation with social, affordable, public, cooperative for limited profit housing providers and their organizations to see what can be done to ease the situation. Now we've heard from uh, Professor Kenna, and I really thank you for that contribution, Professor, because I was really very inspired by it. And I think you're you really you hit the nail. It's it's incredible. Very good, thank you. Uh, it's very much in line with the work of the Urban Agenda Housing Partnership, I must say. But looking into into the solution side, what we can see now is a bit a development where a lot of cities and even member states have adapted very strong regulatory measures, very heavy state intervention to take place. We have seen rent freezes, eviction bans, not in all countries yet, this is a great regrettable thing, but if I would discuss this in the light of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the pillar of social rights, and with regard to the crisis we have now, wouldn't that induce, uh, in fact, an obligation to the European legislator to provide for rent a protection and for eviction bans in all the countries, in all the member states of the EU in this current crisis. If we know that at the moment uh, already, already 8% uh, of households in the EU are, have been unable to pay their rent or mortgage in the last three months, and if we know that 20% of all unemployed people fear to lose their homes at the moment due to corona, I think this also reinforces all the rights-based approach that uh, Professor Kenner was mentioning and that are enshrined in the European pillar of social rights. And coming a bit uh, to, to the more concrete things, I'm not sure if this is now the, the right moment, Kim, but you, you tell me if I have to stop. 
um, when you look at those who are uh, in 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 the position to to help, and it is the cities. Let's remind everybody in this virtual room that more than 70% of all EU citizens live in cities or urban areas. And cities and urban areas have been hit, hit most by the housing crisis already before the corona crisis started. And I just mentioned the, the I would say, the, the diabolic trinity in the housing sector, which is gentrification, financialization, and touristification. And if you have all those, you, it's mostly in cities of Europe that have been hit by all these three developments that have led to uh, the, the housing uh, crisis rise that has been clearly depicted by Professor Kenner also in one of his charts. So look at the cities and see that they are their partners. So if they are the partners to find the solution, I would also recommend that their realities are better reflected in EU policy cycles, such as the European semester. Uh, that has been mentioned. The whole economic governance of the uh, European Union is, is well designed, but it lacks the subnational perspective at the moment. So we are comparing, like what we say in, in, in German, uh, apples with peas or cherries, I don't know. Yeah? So it's, it's really a big problem because as long as you only compare France and Finland, it doesn't make sense. When, when you look at housing policy, you have to compare Helsinki and Toulouse, maybe. Yeah? Uh, and if you don't integrate the subnational reality into the economic governance model, I think you're going to lose out a big, of, a big share of the, pers of the right focus. Uh, when it comes to the country-specific recommendations, which have been mentioned, I'm coming from Austria. And in the last uh, country-specific reports we received for Austria, in fact, the diversified system we have in Austria has been really um, highlighted as a very positive example because it, what it does, and Vienna is a special case, obviously, with a 100-year-old tradition, but having a very strong municipal housing sector and a very strong cooperative housing sector and a very well protected private sector is a good combination to prevent you from gentrification, touristification and financialization. That's a clear thing. And this has been highlighted in the last uh, report for Austria. So now I think that what we have to aim at is to really create more diversity in all the member states with regard to the housing systems, because also what is coming up now with the homeless people. I mean, cities have done amazing things these last three months to take care of homeless people and people who are sleeping rough. But what is going to happen if all the sports facilities or schools or other facilities where they have been brought to now are coming back to, you know, normal functioning? Where are these people going to be? What is the plan? And how will the EU help us? Uh, and is there any provision in, in the whole uh, recovery package, for instance, to help cities directly? This is a big issue at the moment and has been discussed in networks like EuroCities and others where we are looking at, at the possibilities that the new recovery package offers us, but we don't see our place yet in that. So I think that there we, we still have a discussion to lead. Um, I stop here because I can talk hours about that. Kim knows that. Uh, but I just wanted to make the point that if you want to find the solution, talk to the people who are solving the problem already, and that's the cities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michaela. Yes, I know. We, we could spend, I think, a 12-hour webinar talking about this. We are sure. um, <laughs> Yes, that's true. Um, yes, thank you so much. And I also saw that we are now have some questions in the chat. Um, so I want to ask one of the questions. And please, if any of the panelists wants to answer uh, the question, just put up your hand so I know who to give the floor. And the first question um, is about the Hungarian government, who um, is, has practically criminalized homelessness. Um, and can we, can we do something about this um, when we look at, um, at the EU right to housing? Um, I don't know, maybe perhaps um, Mr. Kenner could um, could reply to this. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of areas where there are gaps 
this is when I say there are gaps in the respect for housing rights which fall between the competences at regional and member state level and the EU competences. And one of the issues is how you make uh, housing rights enforceable for individuals. In other words, how do you, how do you um, remove, for instance, the criminalization of homelessness, especially where uh, member states insist that they have constitutional um, rules which provide for certain uh, things to be criminalized. How do you get beyond that argument to say that this is actually a wider social issue? It's a European-wide issue. We have European measures to deal with this. And that criminalizing homelessness, if it's in Hungary or if it's in New York City, in American cities, is not the solution. Uh, I think in many ways it's a political response. It's not necessarily something that we can do through uh, European measures. It's very much a political response. It's also very much about empowering civil society organizations, housing rights advocates, and NGOs to raise the arguments in the appropriate places. Thank you. Um, and we have another question. Um, and it's about um, the role of the European Union to guarantee the continuation of building houses in European countries during and after this corona economic crisis, because previous crises were disastrous for, disastrous for the building sector. Who would like to reply to this? Michaela? Um, I, I think it's a very good question. So thanks to Katja, I think. Katja, who wrote that? Yeah, I can see you, Katja. Um, I think the problem is not uh, the role of the European Union has is, uh, as has been said, very limited because of this competence issue. However, investment is possible. And what we always have to see is that when it comes to housing investment, it's always a combination of several, several, say, finance strands. And one would be uh, obviously what we can get from ERDF or ESF money, and that in good combination. So that's that's already one good little contribution to housing financing. The other is EIB financing. And I must say EIB is doing a great job when it comes to housing investments. And I think that here we should acknowledge also the, the way they do it, because they really have... Um, a clear approach that their housing finances are very, uh, it, it's tenants, uh, it's rental only, it's never for selling, it's with a clear protection of the rental, the, the margins, so there, there's clear limits to the rents, rent caps. They have very concise rules and they could be really serve as a, as a blueprint for any other public, uh, national, regional, uh, funding scheme for housing, I would say. Um, so that's one thing. But what we should not forget, most and of the share of housing finances will come from either national funding schemes, but also from those who use it. So uh, the tenants, the people living in those homes which, which are being constructed. And I think when we talk about housing financing, it gets very abstract very often. I mean, it's about... It's about tax and it's about uh, banks and it's about the way to control all of this. But we, we, we lose out of sight very often the perspective of the users who are contributing substantially to also the construction and financing costs. Because this, another in another way, gives us a, a good argument for participation, for community-led projects, for because also they prove to be economically wise, socially wise, environmentally wise and have a good impact uh, on social cohesion in, in the respective societies. And participation is also part of the, I would say, rights-based agenda that Professor Kenner was so uh, outlining in his, in his speech. I think that is really a, a thing. And here the EU has a role because they can enforce or invite member states and other local authorities to set up housing schemes that are under this participatory approach and that are under this community-led approach and that are under this protective approach uh, for those who are in the end using uh, the housing schemes, which are funded with public money. Let's not forget that. 
Thank you. Um, and Mr. Doloniat, you also wanted to reply? Yes. Thank you very much. Now, just to add to what Michaela was saying, uh, which is very correct, uh, to flag that indeed uh, the EU instruments, uh, as I started to mention, have been considerably reinforced and that as part of the recovery plan, you've seen a number of things happening already. The first thing you saw, uh, it was back in, in March at the start of the crisis, was a total flexibilization of the structural funds, uh, enabling member states to redirect uh, funding to urgent priorities, uh, but also uh, towards different regions. And that is always an opportunity for uh, local and regional actors, uh, of course, to make good use of that money. Now looking ahead in the proposals that were made uh, last week, I think it's important to, to see um, uh, the potential of the instruments uh, managed by the European Investment Bank, indeed, uh, with guarantees from the EU budget. And, and uh, Michel uh, gave very good examples of that. I, I, want, I mentioned the European Fund for Strategic Investments that have played a huge role over the last years. Uh, the successor to that is called InvestEU and would be also considerably reinforced uh, with a social window to finance social infrastructure. Uh, this is meant to leverage private uh, financing and the potential is uh, 50 billion over the next seven years. Um, at the same time, there will be a new generation of structural funds starting, a new ERDF, a new ESF. And what we have also proposed is to allow for flexibility to use part of that money in support of EIB activities. So uh, to give flexibility to uh, regional, national actors to use the money they have under the structural funds to support even more EIB activities. That is a choice for member states, that is a choice for regions, uh, but this is extra flexibility to choose the right priorities. Of course, all of this will have to be discussed with cities, with regions at the national level, and the Commission will be there to facilitate that. Thank you. And I see we're already running out of time. Um, so I would like to give the floor to Mr. Kenna to very shortly reply if he has any comments, last comments. And then I want to give the floor to Ernest to, uh, to give his closing remarks. Thank you very much, Kim. And thank you all for participating. It's been very, very useful for me to get some feedback as an academic because we write reports and we never know if anybody reads them. Um, hopefully people will read this one. Uh, I hope these three, I should say. And I hope some of the stuff has been useful. Uh, I want to contribute as much as possible to all the work you're doing because it's all very, very valuable. And um, I agree with Luke, There's there has been a sea change since I wrote these reports back in, since I finished them back in, in the spring of this year where everything has changed with the the rules on spending and structural funds and there's been so much flexibility increased but i do want to come back to one point though that i tried to emphasize and that is and it also emphasizes michaela's point the problem is cities in europe the problem is european cities european cities are subject to different dynamics than their, as we call, hinterlands. European cities are very much part of global networks. And global networks of, if you like, uh, global finance, which, which moves between them, which creates these phenomena where we have whole blocks of accommodation empty, because it's actually more valuable not to rent them than to rent them. And the big question is, how do we deal with this phenomenon? Uh, it's something that no individual city is able to deal with. It's a European-wide problem. And I think we will need to develop European-wide solutions, which is what I'm hoping we're trying to do here. So thank you all. And that's my last comment. Please, Ernest, go ahead. Well, thank you so much. Uh, to uh, to Patrick, to Luke, and to Michaela for for this uh, uh, interesting webinar. I think we uh, we have uh, many ideas have come to the table. Um, very briefly, as a conclusion, I think that we do have a legal framework uh, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, where we indeed uh, have a, as European citizens particular rights uh, recognized, and we have mandates to the European uh, institutions to act. So even though uh, it is not defined in the treaties as a direct competence uh, in the different fields where the European institutions can intervene in the housing uh, activities, uh, they have a mandate through the Charter to do so. So this is firstly uh, a very clear conclusion. 
Secondly, of course, we do share a common problem at European level uh, when it comes to access to housing. And I liked a lot uh, how Michaela defined it, the, the trinity uh, uh, between gentrification, financialization and touristification, because this is a scenario that many cities are facing. I'm from Barcelona, so you can imagine I'm familiar to that. Uh, and, and really, we really need to have a, a common approach uh, to how do we respond to that. So if we go through the different aspects what the European institutions can intervene. Firstly, we have financial regulation. This is really an issue uh, because indeed uh, housing has become a financial asset. So we have the, the SSM that can uh, intervene in trying uh, to stop bubbles. And we do have regulations who directly affect uh, the, the housing issue. Let me just remind you that we have still on the table the new directive on non-performing loans that is being at the moment uh, uh, negotiated between the parliament and the council that will have a huge impact on the on evictions for instance so this is one particular aspect where we do have an influence and we call legislators need to to step in secondly the semester that was been very well uh, explained by the by the by the speakers here i think we need more ambition personally i think we need more ambition that the recommendations that we have had in the country specific recommendations in the past particularly there is one issue where i think the commission can at least make recommendation and share practices and this is the different systems of topping uh, rents that we have uh, that we have in europe some have been successful some have had more problems but there there is really an experience for instance through the mid prime brenze in berlin and other cities trying uh, to top trends. And here I think the commission through the semester could really play a role in see what works and what doesn't. Uh, and I think that that, that could really uh, be an, uh, also an idea. I also take note of the activities of the EIB, very important, Michaela mentioned that. Um, in Barcelona, we do also have support from the EIB to develop social housing. And I think indeed they're doing a good job. We need to, to, to strengthen that, that part as well. There are two issues that Luke Tolon had mentioned that I think are really important. First is the strategy on the fundamental charter. We have to have a close uh, look at this. And secondly, the review of the two pack and the six pack. This is really important as well. And I know it's in public consultation until the 20th of June. So the, the review of the economic governance. Um, there is the old uh, proposal of treat certain investments differently. Uh, when it comes to our fiscal framework. I know this is very difficult in some uh, public debates, but I do think, and I'm those who support that uh, investment in, in, in social housing should have a, di a different uh, investment treatment. So whether we are able to have that debate in the coming review of the, of the economic framework, I think this is really another, uh, also another important issue. And maybe I, will add, I would like to end also with, um, with, uh, with the coming recovery and resilience fund, uh, which of course it's going to be very important. Uh, I think uh, inside the, the framework of the, the, the ecological transition, we have rehabilitation, of course, as one of the possibility to influence uh, uh, housing. Uh, but I don't know, uh, this is something to be defined in the regulations that we will legislate now and to be also defined in the national plans when they will be presented uh, to access the facility to the commission. Um, how far can we get in supporting public housing uh, and use those funds to support public housing? I think at the moment that possibility is very limited, but of course this is open uh, uh, still, um, uh, the, the package is on the negotiation, so uh, this is also that maybe we should explore. So those are some of the ideas that I noted. I think that there's a lot of food for thought in everything what, that, that you said, and I would like to thank you again and everybody for putting very interesting questions as well uh, from the audience. Thank you.